Now we start our first panel of the day, named the Spectrum for Vertical and Future Scheme for Assignation. For this panel, we have Sebastian Cabello, who will act as moderator. Sebastian is an expert in public policies and consultant of different entities of public and private sector. Currently CEO MCC class, public affairs and advisor among others of Inter-American Development Bank and Latin American Association for Internet. Director General of GCMA in Latin America, where he led the regional agenda representing the mobile industry. And as panelists, we have Josh Lusa, engineer for the Federal Agency of Networks in Germany since 2009, in charge of international management of frequencies, work as technical secretary of FLIPT, involved also in the national process for the assignation of 5G frequencies in Germany. Agustino Linares, spectrum manager, and Anatel Agustino, director, master's degree in the uh, University of Campina, both of them in telecommunications, currently spectrum manager, OBT and radio uh, broadcasting and uh, regulation agency of Brazil and coordinator of the Brazilian Commission for Telecommunications. Omega Isa, director of X Dynamic Axis Innovation, Science and Economic Development, responsible for developing policies that support in the automized management of spectrum alternative ways of assignation. Prior to that, head of commercial strategy section for future uh, capabilities of ICTs in the Defense Department of Canada manager responsible for planning of uh, spectrum public security in Canada and the director has a, a degree in systems and PhD in telecommunications. Christina Data, the policy and then spectrum analysis director and outcome and also executive director and agency Kerapum. Christina led to the work in 5G and other technologies for broadband and upcom. Before working on 5G, Christina led the development of a new spectrum exchange framework and the open policies of upcom. Before going to upcom, he works um, with different operators and strategists, master's degree in engineering management of a Polytechnic Victorino in Italy. Lucas Edicto, policies, public policy director for Latin American GCMA in charge of the development and adaptation implementation of advocacy activities of GCMA in the region with over 15 years experience in telecommunications sector. Prior to that, Lucas occupied different positions in companies such as Ericsson Nokia and in the satellite industry sector, master's degree in business administration from Torquato University, a specialization in telecommunication managed from the Technological Institute of Buenos Aires and engineering title in telecommunications. Francisco Soares, Senior Director of Governmental Affairs in Qualcomm, licensed in electronic engineering from Brasilia University, Vice President of Governmental Affairs in Qualcomm in the Telecommunication Service, where he joined in 2007, responsible for activities related to government in countries across Latin America. Among his main activities, the spectrum issues, regulation policies, participation in ITU and CTEL, and initiatives of social responsibility. Now, we leave you with this interesting panel, moderated by Sebastian Cabello. Sebastian, the floor is yours. Many thanks and welcome. Welcome, all of you. Greetings to the entire Latin America. I am Sebastian Cabello. I am in Buenos Aires right now. I want to thank the National Agency for Spectrum of Colombia to ICT Ministry for this 11th edition of International Congress on Spectrum. It's a I think I participated for the very first one. It's a pleasure to be with you. And also with this very interesting topic that Felipe referred to. We are living times where we are kind of decentralizing the vision of how spectrum is managed. And because there are a lot of new alternative technologies, spectrum management, uh, and also demand that are very special. And one of them is the demand the verticals have in the industry of private networks. And this 
creates without that many debates and also uh, to see how this uh, evolution is being followed in some of the countries that are pioneering this. And we are lucky enough to have in this panel to have four um, leaders, uh, regulators, uh, world class, they are, let's say, leading and thinking and structuring uh, all this stuff because uh, following the development and how the spectrum needs to move forward. I am very happy to have the yeah, German regulator, Budden des Nats, very difficult to pronounce that. And also from the United Kingdom, I said from Canada and the tail from Brazil. And we are going to have uh, this solution representative and acting as provider of technology that is a kind of father of mobile technology that have been involved for GSM Air to GCM Air, et cetera, all those technologies that exist. So for me, it's an honor to participate in this discussion, but also to go straight into the topic of one of the main axes of this debate. You know, perhaps that uh, with this, uh, we are uh, going back to some th spectrum theories, uh, the theory of the common. Some of them think that the spectrum is better managed if they are being, ma is being managed by users. However, that will be quite difficult and it will generate uh, problems of interference. But those debates come over and over again, and it, it's kind of a free thinking. But what we have today really is that the private networks start to be um, a hot issue, so to speak. If you look at debates and trainings and uh, all sort of workshops that are being conducted virtually nowadays, uh, from many providers even, that uh, really serve the central market, uh, 5G, even new mobile technologies other than 5G. Today, they are thinking on how to uh, uh, so satisfy demand by private networks, uh, ports, uh, industrial parts, uh, mining industry, uh, airports even. They're thinking and implementing for point zero technology and develop their own solutions. And now we have one of the topics to be debated that I hope uh, Lucas from the view of the mobile operators can give us uh, uh, some light. Uh, and maybe, well, some of the think that this is going to evolve a lot uh, and that perhaps the best developments will be provided by the companies that design their own networks and they can integrate to the public networks and networks where the traditional companies uh, exist, you know, traditional telecommunication providers, that is, and that, uh, let's say, represent the verticals. There are other verticals, other industries that will continue developing their networks and they will integrate as well. So we have here an entire universe of the public networks that go down to the private networks with some in between them. And we may have private networks with um, uh, special agreements for service with different levels of quality, with different levels of, um, uh, of layers, layers of network slices, or even with different levels of infrastructure management. Up to that, when that industry manages and its owner it's, uh, of their own network and integrates himself with the public network. So we have a lot of things, very interesting one to talk about. And that's why I want to welcome um, the, the, the panelists and start with Josh, the German regulator. Perhaps it's one that, uh, uh, making the earliest uh, developments and implementations of private networks in uh, a 3.5, 3-point air band and some millimetric bands as well. So I would like that in brief comment, uh, some, in some slides you can show us what is your view in Germany about this. So um, to make it very short, so we have uh, uh, awarded the um, 3.4 to 3.7 for nationwide licenses uh, for MNOs, but uh, of course they are also uh, it's also possible for verticals to uh, find uh, solutions with the MMOs to uh, share frequencies with them. Then we have this uh, um, 100 megahertz, with, which is I think a kind of uh, speciality 
for us that uh, we have an individual license process uh, here um, for private local networks, especially for industry. And then uh, since this year, we have the possibility in 26 gigahertz for everybody to apply for uh, individual license. I will give some more details about the um, this 100 megahertz uh, in 3.7 to 3.8 and in 26 gigahertz. So in 3.7 to 3.8 gigahertz, as I said, uh, here we have in this individual licensing uh, scheme for uh, private premises only. So um, for example, a factory can supply uh, apply for um, for their premises to have a private network there. It's not allowed to, for example, supply a um, kind of city. So the premises has to belong to you or you have to um, uh, have some contract with the owner so that you are allowed to have a private network here. In general, the licensee here is free in its planning, uh, but has to respect the following points. So there's no, telecommunication service allowed for the public um, to make a clear distinction to this frequency range we awarded to the MMOs. And of course, you have to optimize your frequency uh, um, usage by um, efficient planning. And then, which is kind of special, is that we here uh, count on the operators. So the operators of geographically adjacent radio networks are obliged to negotiate uh, operators agreement. The idea behind is that the areas which are supplied are so small that um, for us as administration, it's very um, difficult to make a good interference calculation. And um, so I think it would be more restrictive than necessary. So therefore we, uh, we, um, concluded that it's better to leave all the freedom to the operators and find solutions between themselves. So as long as there's no interference, we have no intervention from the administration. And same is uh, for the 26 gigahertz. It's a bit different because um, uh, it's more spectrum and it's a shared band, I think, if, as you know. So here we, here we have also fixed service and fixed satellite service. Um, but as we have some more uh, spectrum, this is not restricted to the own premises. So everybody is allowed to apply for um, for spectrum MMOs and verticals. You can supply also cities. So the premises does not have uh, to belong to you and you can have private and public networks. So this uh, is a bit more open situation than in 26. So, but again, here, the key element is the operator's agreement between the geographically close um, um, networks. So again, here, the operators are free to find best solution. So, um, and we thought uh, from administration side uh, that it's best to leave this, uh, um, yeah, this freedom to the operators for them to find the best solutions and, um, yeah, uh, and we only uh, interact, I think, uh, when there are some problems coming up. So, yes, that's it uh, from my side. So I'm open for questions now, and I'm, uh, again, sorry for the problems in the beginning. I hope that now everything works well. No problem, Josh, and many thanks for your contribution. Now, let's... Um, uh, yeah, each one of us may have four or five slides or a view, and we can then go into a common debate. So we thank you. I thank you all. Okay. Now, now we want to jump to the Americans. Uh, let's go to Canada, uh, to Omega Issa, the PhD and Director of Spectrum Dynamic Spectrum Management. Uh, that is the uh, licensing and policy branch of ICT, which is Innovation, Science and Economic Development, the Canadian government. So, Maya, you know, the floor is here to tell us what are the different views or focus you have uh, over private networks. Sure. Um, good morning. Uh, so, I'm Amia Issa. I'm the Director of Dynamic Spectrum Access at Innovation, Science and Industry Canada. 
So I'll be giving you today an overview of uh, our drivers for private networks, what we consider as approaches and the challenges that we may face actually. So the first, I hope everybody's seeing my screen. I'm not gonna project just uh, because I'm not sure. Of, <laughs> well, great. So our first our drivers for making spectrum for private networks. Um, first, we have uh, objectives to support for the telecom industry. Uh, as you may know, like quality in terms of improving speeds and deploying new technologies, we need to uh, enable that. Coverage is a very key uh, aspect of Canada has a lot of rural and remote areas, so we need to uh, have uh, reliable telecom services in rural and remote. Um, innovation is key also for us uh, because it enhances the productivity for Canadian uh, for the Canadian economy. So uh, it's very important. Um, we have an increased number of requests for spectrum support private networks, private LTE verticals, what we call industry 4.0. And we want to say yes to more Canadian consumers and businesses. Uh, we, we, we don't want to be just cops. We want to be enablers as well. So we also want to take this opportunity to streamline our processes, make them more efficient, faster, and simpler. Uh, we also have a lot of a new spectrum in rural and remote areas, and providers want to have access to, to it to serve Canadians. So those are all our drivers. Um, next, why, like, do we have use cases? Yes, we have use cases. So um, we're looking for campuses, high capacity venues, uh, mission critical, like search and rescue is very important in Canada, automation, especially in agriculture, utilities. And why we still need private networks after all the technology that we have? Because we still need better network performance, low latency, better throughput. We need more control on, and, and data sovereignty is very important. So we need data to stay on premises, uh, restrictions, uh, apply our like custom restrictions. Um, we also need better coverage. So uh, it's still challenging to provide coverage uh, for everybody. So how we're doing or the approaches we're considering. First, what we call uh, pass to dynamic spectrum access, which we define as a machine-based system to support intensive use of spectrum by assigning frequencies based on immediate availability and need. And we have two main approaches for uh, dynamic spectrum access. The first one is a third-party database-driven dynamic spectrum access, and the other one and what we call automated spectrum management for non-competitive local licensing. Uh, the database-driven DSA is about sharing spectrum with incumbents uh, by providing access to licensed exam devices through a database, and it's basically used for TVY space and um, also between fixed wireless satellites, radio astronomy, and Wi-Fi when it uses 60 years. Uh, the other side, which is the automated spectrum management for non-competitive local licensing, basically the licenses are made available through a non-competitive local licensing process. And automation of licensing is sought to support the expected large numbers of licenses over smaller areas and shorter periods. The other approach that we're, kind of, we're, we're doing is what we call access licensing framework. And it's a supplementary licensing process for unused spectrum in rural and remote areas. It's available across a selection of bands in parallel with the existing licensing. And uh, it can be used for wireless broadband or private networks. And uh, it, it, it is done to create additional incentive for licensees to use their spectrum. And if they don't use it, it's a way for others to gain access. It's available for now on in cellular and PCS personal communication services band. And the, public, the consultation was launched in August, 2021. Um, with all of this, we expect challenges or barriers. Uh, the first one, which is the most important, the information that, um, availability of information on spectrum use. It's, it's 
absolutely needed for feasibility studies for understanding what is happening on the ground. However, users have concerns about uh, confidentiality and also it could actually practically it's onerous on them. Um, we have also always concerns about spectrum value and return on investment when sharing. So there's always a trade-off between sharing and, and uh, you know, the, the, like what, what you get um, on your investment. Exclusivity, it tends to be, you know, to give more security to investments. So um, really we need to be creative in, in putting incentives for people to share things. The third one is the coexistence of services and then sharing is definitely adding technical complexity and cost for on both the regulator side and the user side. And furthermore, on the regulator side, we have the expected burden on spectrum operations because uh, it's, a, it's another dimension of monitoring, compliance, checking and enforcement and looking into complaints and all of that. Um, I finished my presentation. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, I'll pass it to somebody else. Thank you. It's an excellent view of uh, Canada and how to use uh, yeah, dynamic use of spectrum and the use of sp spaces, uh, satellite, and the demand of private networks. Now we are going to, to Brazil. Um, and I would like to welcome Agustino Linares from Brazil. He made a public consultation in April 2020. Uh, 3.8, and that is um, mobile and satellite band thought for uh, Industry 4.0. Agustino, welcome. And uh, the floor is yours. So you can give us a view of Brazil. So, welcome. Thanks. Uh, or because, uh, for example, in 3.5 or uh, 3.7 to 3.8 gigahertz, it is uh, sharing uh, the, this spectrum band with fixed satellite service and the um, uh, uh, private networks will work on a secondary basis uh, or you have a low power. So we try to not uh, use a set aside bands uh, when we talk about the IMT bands. Uh, we are also uh, developing a computer-aided tool in order to protect incumbent services. Uh, we expect that the systems will be available until the end of this year. Uh, and uh, basically, our protection constraint is related with distance. And uh, we can present or we can protect any geometrical picture. It can be a circle. It can be a point, and it can be any kind of polygon. Um, so, uh, just a final comment. Uh, the, the authorization will be very simplified, so authorization uh, for uh, uh, private networks. And uh, some bands are already available, and other bands will be available uh, at the beginning of next year. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Agostinho, y muy bueno a ver todo lo que está pasando ahí en Brasil y todos los temas en los cuales... Thank you very much for your presentation, and really, thank you very much for all the things that you're working there and how many things that happen in Brazil. I think that today you're one of the hottest people in Brazil. I mean, you're one of the greats of the regions. You're speaking of 5Gs, you're speaking of private network, aerodynamic is the same one as Andro Larrete, so... In truth, you're actually living very exciting and innovative moments at the time when we're defining the spectrum, or at least in the region, you are the reference frame. So there, thank you, thank you very much. Now that we're speaking about innovation and speaking of some of the most innovative regulators up, so I'd like to welcome Christina. Christina, I mean, they have a, uh, one that is even more open and decentralized of what is shared access. So, Christina, uh, the mic is all there. I hope that we can project it very well. Yes, thank you very much, Sebastian. And thank you very much to Annie for the invitation. And now I am going to speak in English. These are particularly battery A242 is a band where we've got uh, uh, both uh, uh, fixed links and her station, and it's all on a first come, first serve basis. So, we have to make sure, we have to make sure that the uh, request that can work. The user pays the license fees per channel or per base station, as I said, and it's £80 
per 10 megahertz, so it's a, a reasonably uh, reasonably low fee, and then Ofcom grants the license with a condition, so we have introduced condition as well, that uh, within six months of obtaining the license, there needs to be some deployment. If not, the, the license, if there are other licensees, obviously, that want to access that spectrum in that area, can be uh, revoked. In parallel, what I wanted to bring to your attention is also the fact that we have uh, um, authorized access to mobile bands. So no, uh, no spectrum in the UK is exclusive, even if sometimes uh, uh, people would like, uh, um, licensee would like to think uh, that way. So we've introduced an approach which was already available before. So uh, a smaller operator could go and ask to MNOs uh, uh, to use the spectrum in areas where the spectrum was not used. But it was a very diff difficult, uh, difficult uh, discussion to be had with with the MNOs. What we have done, we have put a little bit more of an onus on ourselves because the user applied to us, asked us, "I want some spectrum in a specific location that belong that is uh, in the MNO's hands at the moment, but they don't use it. Can I use it to deliver something else?" And we've already re uh, released some uh, some of these licenses. In particular, for solution that provide, for example, one that was also on the press, back or solution to a caravan camp in an only connectivity. So, to this local license, that we were able to do something like that. And as I said, the numbers are there. So, we are seeing uh, uh, around uh, uh, more than 1,300 uh, shared access licenses led, uh, held by more than 50 companies. So, there is demand for this type of uh, authorization. There is demand for private network. There is demand to support the digital transformation across all of the different uh, industry sectors that we're hoping would uh, take up uh, this solution and as I said we've also seen some demand for uh, the local access licenses in uh, uh, the uh, MNO spectrum. I just wanted to finish very quickly setting all of this in the context of our spectrum strategy that we just published in uh, July this year which is uh, on top of supporting wireless innovation and promoting spectrum sharing is also very much focusing on licensing to fit local and national services because we've really uh, we recognize the different type of users out there may still want some wide area nationwide type of spectrum but there is also a lot of interest for more localized private indoor outdoor sort of spectrum which is quite uh, which is quite important for us so with that said i have uh, completed my slides thank you very much again for the invitation and looking forward to the discussion muy bueno, Cristina, y la verdad, bueno, te voy a preguntar un poco cómo, cómo les está yendo también con esta, esta modalidad que iniciaron en 2019, y, y, y bueno, eso lo vamos a dejar un poco para... Y eso lo vamos a dejar un poco para el debate después, ahora quiero pasar a tener una visión de la industria, a esas personas que ven el tradicional business y están evolucionando ahora en el full um, deployment de 5G en Latinoamérica, y también van a ofrecer servicios... Uh, B2B or wholesale services, what vision do you have that uh, you may have about the use of private networks? Lucas, please. Hi, Sarah. Uh, thank you very much. Well, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Good, fantastic. It worked. So, well, look, well, thank you very much to save us and thank to the A&E for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to have friends of the a &E and and the National Agency of Spectrum of Colombia. And then we have here the visit here of the mobile industry about the spectrum for vertical networks. It's a bit of recum. This issue of private networks is not nothing new. It's actually they existed before and they're existing in the future and so on. And then we are doing that for the transport with security, even for one-way communication, two-way communications, like walkie-talkies and so on. So in general, the spectrum for verticals, I mean, it's nothing new. I mean, it was used in your own spectrum outside of the mobile, key mobile ones. And obviously the needs evolve and, and they would give cases that appear. And um, in many of these, vertical ones they actually migrate or actually they have a need of a broadband they appear in networks and local networks 
of like fourth generation of 5G. And then actually, I think someone will speak something there for manufacturing in digital ports and so on. So I think it's a bit of a uh, repertoire of where we're coming from and where we're at right now. And these may be something of what can impact on the operators, especially on certain measures or some different aspects that we were adopting in the world, for example, like a Z size for local licenses, key 5Gs or some core or something of 2.5 or some 5 gigahertz and so on. So that implies an impact of the industry where the operators, uh, they can end up paying more of the spectrum as a good economist would say, and when we have less offer, then we have actually things priced there. So Z size of the core bands here, 5G, we have an options, and then we limit the future that we have the spectrum that we can use for network this one, this. And then we have the points of the uh, world conference, we see that it actually appears one one case of the agenda, so 3.5, adding uh, the spectrum downwards, upwards, and some traditional ones that you have 3, 4, 3, 6, um, that at some point in time, there were non-core bands, but then as evolution, they do become core bands. Another, another list uh, that is the sharing of the spectrum of core 5G bands, there's less, well, I guess it wouldn't apply that general for Latin America. I think we see it far more in what is the US, uh, given the, uh, uh, the scarcity that they have a spectrum in middle bands. I am not going to dwell too much on that point for Latin America. And then there are other, some other approach, like is the sublease, which is an interesting model to my view, where the spectrum allows marketing it from the operators to another industry that eventually may be requiring. So I think it is important to strip away barriers so that um, one can hint that could be hindering these type of new activities. So I think the vision that we have as an industry is that the current approaches they actually support properly the, the, the needs of the vertical networks. We don't see any problem with the approaches of designating current uh, spectrum that are already approved. We know that commercial operators are properly prepared to tolerate all these vertical ones. We were speaking about network slicing of how you 5Gs uh, and, and, and flexible, uh, flex, flexible networks is actually go hand in hand to give special needs to connectivity according to the needs of the norms of greater velocity. Clearly, the operators have the experience of building networks, economies of scale, and obviously they can be part, uh, trusted partners to be able to, to have those networks that uh, we have of the resilience of, of one way that they do of the demands of their necessary and so on, they actually are doing with the non-licensed band and some other type of uh, other type of spectrum bands. They can be good cases for vertical ones, and this the non-licensed spectrum is already used in many cases for private networks. I think that we mentioned already that um, the um, the venues where these spectrums are actually exploited can be easily controlled so the quality of service is even better because they're subjected to even less interference and as we mentioned in the time that we were speaking about the, the leasing agreements also add options to the offer to the supply or as a matter of fact there is a, there is a tradition where operators have showed some some sort some of a spectrum sub list where it is permitted so operators can actually start in a, a sub lease process to be able to provide the vertical networks to have access to spectrum a specific spectrum and to build their own networks and we think that this reduced the impact preserves the benefit 
of those who give greater value to the spectrum. And we have, as a matter of fact, even lesser risk the deployment of these uh, five generation networks. Finally, finally, what I was saying uh, many a times, uh, the ones that we have there, uh, and then we, it takes many years and they're very costly to undo because it's important that the regulatory decisions are taken as evidence-based and not only to stand, to, to, to be on a trend of what's happening in the region and other things are there. No, the world is heterogeneous. Latin America is not Europe. It's not Asia and it's not North America. And within Latin America, it's not one Latin American to, to say country A to country B so as not to tarnish anyone's uh, susceptibilities. But I mean, we're different. So you don't jump on a bus of trends but rather just do it evidence-based as to why you want to do what so that you are not into the global wave and this. With that, I don't want, without further ado, and to respect the time and Willie. Hey, thanks, Luca. Uh, excellent, clear. It's evident that the mobile industry has a business already in place and also the provision of wholesale business innovation on the other hand. So, what do companies, uh, companies that are the brains of the mobile world think? I want to welcome Francisco Suarez. Many of us know him already because uh, he is uh, running across the region. Uh, Francisco, are you there? I'm here. Yes, sir. You can go ahead with your opinion. And good day, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Yes, depending where you are. So I would like to start by conveying some messages uh, from Qualcomm in respect to private networks, for instance, that for us, it's a quite important topic as providers of technology. We believe that uh, 5G private networks are going to be uh, have an important deployment. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yep, can you see my screen now? Yes, thank you. So, this is a kind of a puzzle that I think we have heard about the spectrum and the most important, you know, what it means for private networks. But I would like to convey a message that is very much focused on the millimetric bands and the 5G. And we believe that from a point of view, to have a full 5G, we need to use millimetric um, waves and um, to, let's say, place the uh, entire capacities of all together, all of us together. So, so it is a kind of sub six gigahertz uh, millimetric waves. Uh, we have a greater capacity, millimetric waves as uh, a fixed wire axis. Uh, wireless axis can have a, uh, when with deployment of 5G plus connectivity through fiber, the millimetric waves may also have a, a greater uh, flexibility, easily scalable with high performance. This is a, a, a characteristic of a standalone system, really. So that case, we may have a better, more efficient use of uh, the infra critical infrastructure, infrastructure for industry 4.0 with uh, less la latency, more development, efficient development. So this is kind of a, uh, the, the development of the system with um, connectivity for many things that we have been talking about. We are talk we're talking about public networks, for instance, about fixed wireless and networks uh, and private networks among others. Uh, intelligent transportation in a smart city. Um, and this important topic here is that the, the uh, uh, private network. So with 5G, I believe there's going to be a, a 
strong development of private network uh, supported by 5G connectivity. And this I'm showing here, uh, this is what we expect. <laughs> no, uh, this I think will represent about 13.1 trillion dollars, providing a huge impact to the, the economy. Uh, and uh, the different verticals on the right hand side of the screen, uh, each of uh, how each verticals are, let's say, impacted and packaged within the overall economy. Uh, just to mention a few, uh, Industry 4.0, manufacturing, uh, smart manufacturing, that is, uh, in both of, of them, we believe um, uh, 5G, it's uh, going to be uh, quite important for them. Uh, there will be a strong deployment of this uh, de development. Uh, also, in this slide is, uh, I would say, is quite specific look from the 5G private networks point of view, where is going to have a, a greater importance and not also in different verticals, but in what part of these verticals, uh, for what type of applications to be more specific, uh, maybe uh, oil and gas industry, oil refineries, ports, uh, hospitals, the airport, uh, the private networks there will be quite important to, uh, let's say, uh, provide connectivity, to, to, to especially to enjoy a very low, low latency, to provide greater security in communications. Uh, with uh, once more mass reinforce uh, with less latency, which in robotics is uh, something that is quite important. Mm. And all this, and even more when we talk about private networks. Now, to give you an idea that what we have for the industry, we could have a private networks, uh, private networks, uh, uh, or with the deployment and development uh, by a private entity or uh, in, uh, public networks. But uh, the way this can be deployed uh, uh, by private networks, we believe is an uh, important opportunity for operators, uh, for mobile operators, there are discussions being held around the world to why uh, this private networks uh, could be a threat for uh, operators, but we believe that's not the case. The, this uh, separate spectrums can be used by operators and other portions of the spectrum can be used by private networks, giving way to new businesses for operators. We don't share the idea that this is uh, uh, it's going to be a threat uh, just because there are private networks, they are a threat for operators. No, on the contrary, we believe that that constitute an opportunity to create new uh, businesses and for licenses and non-licenses. Um, uh, this is a, a new uh, concept you know, to have a separate spectrum for these activities and the operators can even use this spectrum to provide their businesses um, both through public or through private networks and the screen i'm showing an example of uh, the ways we can uh, provide a private network or with a private spectrum even or using a uh, or using a, uh, one may say another way of doing it, and it is uh, through an operator that is providing the connectivity to its own network. But the uh, the, the entire idea behind this is to uh, provide a, a good environment for the development of private network. And so the operators have the opportunity to do both. Uh, really, that's the way we see it. So, as I said before, 
this is a, a, a strategy that operators can use. They can focus on private networks and provide that connectivity. Uh, this is uh, quite interesting. Uh, as I said before, we um, share the view that a threat. This is a separate use, the separate spectrum. So that was <laughs> my presentation, the message I have uh, for you. And I'm open to questions now. Many thanks. And I like that uh, point of view of Qualcomm. Um, so I congratulate you for that. Which, what I'm saying is that because I like it, it's because they have solutions for everything, licenses and non-licensed spectrum, uh, private networks, independent private networks that can be, uh, let's say, take advantage of connectivity provided by operators, so all sorts of use here. So I want to, we don't have much time really, but I have some questions that uh, they told me to peerless you, you know, are you saying that, uh, a colleagues from Annie, for instance. So I would like to start by Josh. I, Josh, are you there? Uh, you told us a little bit um, how you are trying to uh, uh, administer or manage the spectrum to avoid interferences, for instance, it's in very specific zones, for instance. No, the owners of the spectrum could be uh, up there. So perhaps you can tell us, uh, all of us, uh, how are you implementing that? You talk about the early implementations. I, I read about Siemens, Bosch, BMW, instance, but tell us a little bit how this is being worked in practice. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the question. Can you hear me well? Yes, okay, so super. Um, yes, so I think um, all of us, we are still uh, with all these frequency bands uh, and these 5G applications, we are still in a kind of um, experimental status. So we have a lot of um, uh, contact to our application or applicants. So, and uh, do some, some consultation. Um, so, and uh, of course, they are also trying out uh, a lot of things. So we have a couple of uh, licenses now for for industry, as you mentioned, for Siemens and uh, um, Bosch and um, Audi and so on. For example, uh, BSF, which is a big uh, um, a chemical factory, they uh, already started their their. Uh, um, trials uh, uh, with the old kind of licenses, so they they have uh, again a lot of experience now. They run, for example, autonomous driving on their factory um, site uh, with these frequencies. So we have a lot of different applications, and um, we, together with the application uh, uh, or licenses, we try to like figure out which is the best solution for them. So. Um, we have about 180 licenses now, and it's very like flexible. And we're trying really to have a good, uh, good communication with them, so and help and uh, support them. I think that's uh, at least in the very beginning, it's very important to to be flexible, to have a, a lot of communication, see where are their problems, and try to support uh, the the licenses wherever we can. Many thanks, Josh. And now I want to ask Isa, uh, uh, what's going on? Okay, you told us that uh, you are being uh, experimented with the dynamic explanation of spectrum and other ways of sharing spectrum satellite. So, but in practice, however, maybe you can, can tell us about one company. Uh, uh, what is the experience of assignation there? Um, if I, I can recap that, you want me to give you an example of, of a case, a use case or a company? Is that right? Okay, so yeah, um, we, we actually have, um, uh, what we call wireless internet service providers, which are really small operators that they don't have uh, usually the deep pockets to go to actions. 
And they are actually looking forward to such uh, a way of uh, getting the spectrum and being able to deploy their local uh, networks without really having the big funds to go and, and, and compete with the big players or the big MNLs. Uh, we have also agriculture, uh, um, you know, uh, factories and, 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 and farms actually, um, that, you know, knocking on our doors because those are usually in very rural and remote areas and um, is not, there is no actually return on investment for the big players to, to, to cover them. Usually they don't really look at them. Um, so they are actually... Um, looking forward to have their own uh, networks. Um, wireless uh, kind of uh, license exempt is not an, an option because they still need to, to have this broadband access by the end of the day. So they want us, and, and, and some of them, they, they actually care a lot about confidentiality and, uh, and, and security, especially the utilities. Um, it's a, it's a critical infrastructure for us. Uh, so uh, they need really to have their own control on, on, on their own network. So that's, uh, those are three use cases that we're uh, starting to see in the Canadian um, horizon. So that's, uh, that's from my part. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question. <laughs> yes, yes, este, uh, yes, very good answer. Um, Creo que es muy interesante entonces ver cómo eh, los So it's quite interesting to see how regulators are designing different mechanisms to adjust demand for the allocation of spectrum, as I mentioned. There are small providers that uh, cannot participate in an auction, so they have other mechanisms so that they can use the spectrum and they are also accommodating to those uh, critical missions that require uh, the pr proper control. Regulators start to have, uh, as Agustinio was saying recently, and also Felipe, uh, it's living already that it is actually a new reality to design all sorts of allocation mechanisms. Christina, uh, uh, innovated with this uh, share access that you have in place since 2019. How is working that in practice? Is there the man is actually the question. Thank you, Sebastian. Yes, I was on mute. Uh, yes, we, we, there, is, uh, there is demand, as I said. We have, we have issued quite a lot of licenses, but I actually wanted to give you as well some examples of different type of use cases, starting exactly from where uh, where you were talking at the beginning, private network by MNO, private network by service provider, etc. In the 38242, we have uh, authorized a lot of access uh, for different companies, for example, we've got uh, Verizon in, uh, uh, from the US working with the port of Southampton to deliver a, a specific private network there using our spectrum. We got the port of Felix though, so there is a lot of, we're on island obviously, there is a lot of private network for, uh, uh, for ports uh, and uh, they want the private network solution because they need to control it, they cannot afford to have outages, the network needs to be on 24-7, so it's incredibly important. Uh, we've got an uh, example in manufacturing, uh, we've got Bosch uh, in Worcester, the north of England, uh, that has used as well the 3842 uh, gigahertz spectrum to improve the robotic line. At the complete other end of the private network, we got actually uh, an MNO who has delivered a private network for another uh, manufacturer. So we got Vodafone and uh, Ford. There is a big, big plant, uh, Ford plant at uh, the east of London, and Vodafone is working with Ford to automate the production line, but with a private network. So Vodafone has used some spectrum, but they don't use the, in that specific area to generate a private network or forward. And as uh, Lucas was mentioning in his slide, we've also got some use of license exams. So the Ocado model, Ocado is a distribution started with food distribution, now it's becoming a lot more than just food distribution. 
had these robots and I went to visit it. Incredibly fascinating solution. The robots all, all controlled by LTE uh, unlicensed using 5.8 gigahertz. So in the UK, we've been a little bit like, we want to enable, we let you do whatever you want, of course, as long as it doesn't interfere. But we have seen all possible models of uh, uh, delivery come up uh, uh, in, in the market. Espectacular, Cristina. La verdad que interesantísimo ver. Well, quite interesting to see the model of a food company, a phone, and for everything you mentioned, every, everyone is testing that. So we are opening the door to big innovations in respect to Spectre, and that, of course, is excellent. Agostinho, um, you have a slide. I have them here already, and you were telling us that computer-aided tools that you have uh, uh, thinking to implement. We know that is a proposal that you, along with your technical team, is considering. But my question is, what time do you see that this is going to be placed? Is it going to be a public consultation, for instance, before? So when do you think this is going to be implemented more, uh, maybe gradually or massively? I don't know, in Brazil. What are you thinking about? The software is uh, almost ready. And we think that by December, we are going to have the first uh, part, so to speak, of the software ready and go for the approval by the superintendent, approving the use. Uh, it may be the beginning of next year, we can have the first private networks utilizing these bands, the 3.7, 3.8. Right now we are using 3.3 megahertz. Um, and the company that wanted can request use of that today. So in each band, there is a different pipeline, but 2.3, uh, 2.4 is available already. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, we are a little bit over the time. I want you to give the priority to regulators, but I thank Lucas and Francisco. Uh, your presentations could be seen completely, and we have now a clear vision uh, the, of the industry. Uh, for instance, maybe later on in the social media will be shared. And Francisco, uh, flexibility to adapt to all sorts of demand. So we thank you all. The truth, it was a high level panel with the presence of a German regulator, Canada, UK, Brazil, and and also a provider, uh, the, port, the spokesman of the mobile industry, Qualcomm. So thanks to you and to, uh, we continue with the conference.